If there's anything worse than a limousine liberal, Morton said, it's a Gulfstream environmentalist, Michael Crichton. So why does old money support the left? I'm bringing back the old money series on Analyze Finance with Nick, because this is a question that I've been asked a lot by viewers, both in my re in real life and through comments on this channel, because... Because old money was overthrown by uh, people, possibly many times, depending on how old it is. And they know that it is what keeps people in the game. Whatever keeps people in the game is uh, good for them. Why tends to be like more for me, which always leads to some kind of... Uh, the boiling point. Because Let's a lot of people seem to be baffled that the richest and most powerful people in the world are often aligned with what would be perceived as socialist or politically progressive causes that on paper at least seem to undermine their relative status and position. Or what if I told you actually? Okay, that, that's just virtue signaling though. It doesn't really... It's not really a good idea to pay attention to what people, politicians are saying especially. It's like, oh yes, yes, they're probably going to do the very opposite. Or they're just saying and uh, just do whatever, right? Actually, is the other way around, where progressive politics and highly progressive taxation enable their relative power and allow old money to stay on top rather than cut them down with everybody else. First, yeah, money is abstraction, right? The thing is, there's a lot of non-economic reasons why some members of old money may support the left. First, a lot of it could be youthful idealism, which is a lot of reason why people support left-wing politics in general. And if you are from old money and don't have to deal with practical financial limitations that people in the middle classes tend to do, you can hold on to a lot of these more idealistic left-wing progressive views for a lot longer because there's no economic consequences for not doing so. There's also intellectual fashions and trends. If you live in a place like San Francisco or Hollywood, yeah, but I wouldn't believe this, right? I I'm, would be entirely evaluating them based on how much of their money they gave away. That's it. It would. That's not absolute, but percentile sense. Like if you no, I'm not forcing them into just I'm just saying that if someone is like uh virtue signaling about like, oh yeah, I care so much, they probably don't. Totally unacceptable to be aligned with the political right, and many people will just become a product of their environment in terms of their voting patterns and political ideologies, even if it's against their own interests. And then on an individual issue by issue basis, there may be personal or family reasons why people will take a certain side in that issue, and that could affect their politics as well. The other thing is also also worth saying that in America, for example, I, I think that's what he's talking about. You basically have a choice between uh, the far right party, which is the Republicans, essentially, and the center right party, which is the Democrats. At least if you look at look into it in as a on, a on a global scale certainly most uh parties are center right but still <laughs> also on the social side a lot of people prioritize uh europe is a little bit more to the left like social issues over economic issues especially those who are more wealthy and already have more money than what to do with they don't really care much about economic issues that they'll be fine either way and so they may prioritize social issues because of either empathy or to legitimize certain vices that they have and social acceptability is really the only downside to abusing such vices where as for middle and lower class people there are major negative economic consequences for pursuing a similar lifestyle so with yeah but in that case they're not gonna give away a significant amount they're only gonna well it might seem significant to some but they only gonna give away a token amount for optics. <clears throat> With that out of the way, I want to get into the hard economics of why the old money tends to support the left. And originally, they didn't. In fact, really, if you go back to when the modern left-right dichotomy began in the French Revolution, the right wing literally was the old money and the protected established interests. And this really happened to be most of the case until the, the World Wars happened. But in Europe, there had been several revolutions, whether it was the French Revolution, 1848, and later the Bolshevik Revolution, which scared a lot of the old money and the nobility to the point that if they wanted to keep anything, they felt like they needed to give something to the lower classes because it's better to have maybe a little bit less and provide social safety nets than be killed in a revolution. In fact, some of the most old money... It's also meaningless too, because suppose you give away some money to the poor person. Like, I, I, I used this metaphor before, like, uh, let's say that you're winning the game of Monopoly, and... You are just handing out cash to those to the losers, right? So the game keeps going, right? But the losers have no chance of winning, right? The essentially what you're paying for is that they're just gonna keep running the game that you already won, and they're just gonna keep handing back the money that you gave them. So yeah, money and patrician leaders. In Essentially, it's like putting uh, money from your right pocket to your left pocket. The Western world, such as Audubon Bismarck and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, ironically, were the ones who were the most aggressive in expanding the social safety net, with such as <clears> Germany <throat> being the first major country to have some sort of social security, national pension, and minimum welfare state, and FDR being the founder of the New Deal, which radically changed the economic relationship between individuals and their government in the United States of America. So 
these people were the first ones to be aware of how much of their status really was at risk if they did not pacify the masses. So let's also look at what are the goals that old money wants out of the political system. They don't really need any direct handouts themselves. So their goals are a little bit different. And they don't really need the government to improve competition and infrastructure to allow the emergence of new businesses or new technologies or innovations because new technology and new innovation historically are disruptive and they challenge the status quo that they're already at the top of. So what old money people want are mainly three things. Two, they want, want the removal of competition. Like there's nothing worse to old money people than new money competing with them for their spots at the country club or their relative status in society. Third thing that old money wants is they want the cost of living a life of leisure to be as low as possible for their peers, but also prohibitive for newer people to have it as well. And the yeah, that's a good point. By by supporting the left, you actually screw with those who are trying to rise up. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. The way you do that is having some sort of slave or mercenary class at the bottom of the social hierarchy. And if you look at the history of civilization, really the ancient times to now the modern era, there's always been some bottom slave slash mercenary class who has either been literally bonded to the nobility or in the modern day, since we thankfully eliminated chattel slavery in that system, it's more people being forced or compelled into conditions where they work below the cost of living or below subsistence in order to keep costs down for the elites. This explains why you would see a lot of the old money elite tend to be in favor of high levels of low skilled immigration, because that keeps the cost of their servants or other people who help them maintain their lifestyle. And since they're rich and can isolate themselves, they don't have to deal with the social consequences. I mean, good enough to maintain their lifestyle, but definitely not enough to rise up or uh, rise up the ranks, right? And not too little. So they have nothing to do and they grab their pitchforks of such a policy. And this has been not just a modern phenomenon. I mean, if you look at ancient Rome, you had 35% of the population be slaves. And if you look at most medieval and early modern societies, there's some form of slavery or serfdom. And that is kind of helps and keep the upper nobility entrenched in power and they can do it. Yeah, because it is contingent on it. You only have property as long as others also agree with that. You don't have property if I don't agree with that. Like, what, what do you have? Like, this, this is your dirt? The, the, the one I'm standing on? Hmm? I don't think so. And also, you only have money if others take it, right? If I said, like, I have a 1 billion monopoly money and you don't take it, I have nothing, right? So it is important to invest other people into the same system that you're already winning. Because if some uh, young whippersnapper thought like, oh yeah, you know, let's do communism. You know, all, all stuff is all, all of ours. And, you know, we have got to have new money. That's going to be the nightmare of anyone who is dominating the current status quo. And maintain their life of leisure at a cost that is below what it would be if it was true, <laughs> fair, and free competition. The other side to this coin too is their middle classes and the native lower classes who get frustrated with such a system. They have no loyalty to the top of the hierarchy, whether it's the king or the emperor or the establishment political party, because they feel like this is a raw deal for them. And so this oftenness also extends to the elites importing a mercenary class who will fight their wars for them or be the enforcers <laughs> against civil disobedience and dissent. We've seen this example with the Germanic barbarians being the bulk of the Praetorian Guard for the Romans, the early Islamic caliphates importing the Turks to be their enforcer class and mercenary class, the Byzantines doing it with the Slavs. And you can argue that's kind of what's going on in modern times in the West to a certain degree. If you can't get your own people to support your or political causes or your current status hierarchy, you import people who will vote for the, to preserve the status quo. I'm not really going into whether this is right or wrong, but if you look at history, usually the so-called enforcer classes often many times become the elites themselves because they realize they're the ones holding the power because they're the ones enforcing the current hierarchy. But in terms of economic interest, that's part three, why they would want to have the slave class. But in terms of explaining the other two parts, preventing competition and preserving stability. Stability is obvious. If you have... Well, these enforcers in, in current day and age would be managers or uh, police or the military. I guess. Wars, or if you have a lot of unrest and disruption, and then it's going to be harder to live a comfortable life. Also, if you have too free of an economy or too low regulations, and you have new businesses coming in all the time being competitors to your existing business or a new technology that puts your source of wealth on the line from becoming obsolete, then you know what? You don't want that. Like progress and innovation is actually a threat to old money. Like look at an example. Say if you have a family who's made all of their money in drilling for oil, and we come up with some miracle fusion engine that you don't need to ever have gasoline again. You can have all these electric cars and the batteries are so good that you can go a thousand miles on charge and you have the fusion for the power plants and there's also discovered some alternative chemical that can make a lot of the plastics let's say there's no more use for oil due to technological innovation well this old money family whose wealth is built on owning oil wells are all of a sudden going to be in the poorhouse and they don't like that they'd rather yeah they're never going to be in a poorhouse <laughs> they already gathered so much money that there's no chance they also already diversified their wealth they bought a bunch of things there's just zero chance that unless there's going to be a complete reshaping of, of our world that they ever gonna land on the bottom or anywhere not on the top rather have regulations prevent those technologies from either being invented in the first place or being implemented into the market for commercialization very slowly if not ever it's not just oil too let's just say for example the technology advanced to the point where you could build skyscrapers that are hundreds of stories for half the cost then if you built your whole career on say owning low-rise apartments in a certain city you and have your threat 
because now these high rises are going to be built cheaper and they're going to make rents lower. So your income is going to go down. So instead you'd want to pass restrictions on construction and development so that nobody else can build apartment buildings so that your old money family who owns all the currently constructed apartment buildings gets to keep their source of wealth without competition. So this is why old money would generally be pro business regulation because it keeps out new entrants. And even if your business. Yeah, that's a very important point to echo that uh, capitalism causes scarcity because there's money in it. Your business is not directly affected by a new technology. Let's just say there's a new innovation or some new business that is successful and the founder accumulates a lot of money and gets rich. Well, you know what? You're going to now have to deal with somebody who's going to compete with buying houses in your neighborhood, potentially pricing you out of your neighborhood or pricing you out of your memberships to your private clubs or enter your exclusive groups that you don't really want new entrants in. And that's a social threat to you. Or they may exceed you in net worth and therefore they may have more influence in terms of politics or the broad culture. And as a result, your relative power, if your absolute power is still there and your absolute wealth is still there, your relative status drops. And so... This yeah, very important point. That... That is why you don't see people like, suppose you had 1 billion and another person had 1 billion, then that's worthless. I mean, if, if you had 1 billion, you shouldn't be hoping for another billion. You, you should be hoping for that the other person ends up with nothing. So they become your servant. They have no choice. This explains why. Because money really doesn't matter. Right. I mean, in Europe, this would be even more uh, blatant because you might see like old, old money and uh, like pre-war money, uh, like it just, it just all around the place. Maybe like a, a briefcase full of paper. No one cares. So it's pointless. So it is just relative power. I, a lot of old money support progressive taxation is because they've already made their a relative power to exercise your will money. So they're not really hurt by progressive taxation nearly as much. Whereas anybody who is an up-and-comer who is trying to move up in the world, they are hurt because they're going to have to give a big chunk of their earnings and wealth to the government as they move up. And it may prevent them from moving up to begin with because they won't be able to compound the same amount of wealth that the previous generations were able to do. And that along with the rate... You do see this a lot. You do see this a lot that uh, income tax tends to be pretty high to discourage, to, to make it difficult for people to get rich. But wealth tax... Not not as much. Capital gains, not as much. So if you have money, you can probably just shuffle it around, try to grow it, and that's probably going to work out just great. But if you try to make the money and uh, and you pay tax on it, just legit, you might actually end up with a failing business because the other guy is finding ways to not pay his tax. So, yeah. The regulatory barriers to entry keep new money competition out of old money circles. So that's why you can see a lot of these progressive economic policies actually serve the interests of old money. The main enemy of old money is not the poor. In fact, they often have a paternalistic relationship with the poor because they feel like since they're the stewards of society because they've been the ones who've been on the top for the longest, they're kind of in a paternalistic way responsible for the lower classes. The re I mean, the poor are their enemies too, assuming the poor get desperate or, or rise up. <laughs> the real enemy of old money is the middle class and the potential new money. If you have a generous enough of a safety net that people are comfortable and or middle paying jobs that are comfortable enough that people have the basic comforts without a need to rebel, but they don't pay enough that people can accumulate savings to build capital, to create businesses or their own forms of influence to challenge the current social hierarchy. That's the ideal. This is what's going on in Europe. Due to the generous social safety nets and high taxes, you have a social hierarchy that effectively has the old money elites and the political class. And then below that, you have most people, which are from American standards would be lower middle class and a few who are dependent on the state. And there's really not much mobility between those groups. You're either in the middle class group who's really kind of going to be born there or die there or you're going to be in the old money group. They have, through the generous honesty of the safety net, eliminated really the abject poverty bottom of the group. And at the same time, they've cut off new money. So, like, and that's the trade-off that those societies have made. The only one likes that because their status is not going to be challenged. Their wealth is not going to be challenged. In America, however, due to just a different history and a different culture, never fully enacted a social safety net and a progressive tax system strong enough to have the same incentive structure as in Europe. So we still have a challenger class in this country. And what the, a lot of the elites on the left Left and why the old money elites often support them want to work together to basically eliminate this challenger class. A lot of left, they have, there's income here that could be used for my progressive causes. And the old money is like, wait, wait, we can cut these people at the knees and we'll never really have anybody challenge our money. You do see this a lot that, uh, well, in recent times, a uh, chat GPT rose up and immediately, as they rose up, they already started like, oh my god, we need some rules against the AI. <laughs> Hilarious. Our money status or as, as you as you as you make it even a little you immediately want to kick away the ladder or power and so that's why they cooperate because one they also have a can feel good that they're doing a good thing clean up some of their guilt for being rich by saying hey look we're not gonna let any more people join our club and make a more equal society for the rest of us and that also there are uh just a bunch of stories of like elite overproduction or they were just uh too many elites but also you understand that that doesn't work because you cannot have a society where everyone has like 10 billion dollars and who's gonna work Who, who's gonna work seriously 
that doesn't work. So that just usually, well, leads to infighting. Or the the poorer ones end up uh, just falling down, I, I guess. But the easiest way to have social mobility, the most common form of social mobility in our day and age, or this easy to achieve, is that you are rich and you become poor. <laughs> Although if you were very rich, that's almost impossible. That is, I think, a primary reason why you see old money, at least on economic reasons, side with the left, is because it prevents any sort of new money or counter elite threatening their existing position. So overall, why old money supports the left? It's mainly just to protect their relative status. And as maybe, whether it's intentional or unintentional, the consequences of a lot of left-wing economic policies is what it does is it entrenches those who are already at the top at the expense of emerging wealth, new money, or disruptive entrepreneurs shaking up the system. The thing that's interesting, though, is... Yeah, those le left-wing policies, I mean, okay, he's talking very generally, but if the left-wing policy started taxing wealth and... uh I guess also considering tax havens. Yeah, that would not be popular. <laughs> that was AI technology might be shifting this. It might actually be the first technology that doesn't really create a threat to old money, but might solidify their status. And I'm going to talk more about this in a future video about how class warfare has evolved in the 21st century and what direction it is likely to go. Feel free to comment if, or like, just subscribe, share. If you disagree, I'd love to hear from you. If you do agree and have some further... Yeah, I, I don't know. What, what could be a solution? I guess we... We might go to a place where the the requirements for living are just so abundant that money becomes pointless. I guess maybe. Then ho hoping that uh, capitalism doesn't end us before that, before that time. Otherwise, who knows? Some some kind of disruption that uh, anyone with any power would fight. So yeah. It's not something to be overly optimistic about and enthusiastic. Points you'd like to add. I'd also like to hear from you. Thank you for watching. All right.